All right. Um, may we begin? Can we settle down? I sensed in the um, uh, morning uh, discussions just at the beginning something that has seemed to me a bit of a paradox in what I've read about Habitat uh, too, both the uh, preparation materials prepared for it and the discussions here, and that is a, um, a kind of ambivalent view of the city, largely negative in many of its consequences, but also some voices stressing the positive aspects of the city. Not only uh, the um, uh, spiritual and cultural values that Charles Correa mentioned this morning, but also um, as ultimately perhaps conservers of energy, users of fewer resources than more widely distributed populations, more efficient um, heating, um, transportation, and so on and so on. And I just wonder, going back to you, Charles Correa, um, do you feel that the positive role of the city is being buried uh, in the alarm about the, um, the future growth of the cities, particularly in the developing world, and do the growing cities in the developing world have the same creative role that they had in the developed world in preceding centuries? Um, Can you push well, your button? Yeah, yeah, I've done that. Yeah, I'm ready. No, it, it seems to me that what uh, Professor Stressinger mentioned was a very important issue. How do we humanize megacity? Um, my phrase about Bombay, which I think my friend uh, Mr. Fulham perhaps misunderstood, was given, it was said with irony that great city, terrible place. The thing is that given what a terrible place Bombay is, the issue is how wonderfully people humanize it. They make it livable. And I think that's a very, very important point. Cities aren't going to be as beautiful as we want them to be right overnight, all of them, in 10 seconds. But What's, what's working for us is the fact that the people, through their networking, through the mythic meanings they give a city, they, they can use it. And to that extent, you'd be surprised, but it's true, that Bengalis still love Calcutta, in spite of what any of you think of it. And uh, I think I uh, would say that if I go to an American city like whatever it is, Chicago, what have you, where the crime rate is very high, I still acknowledge the fact that many Americans love living in cities like that. So I suppose the equivalent would be great city, murderous place, you know, but people put up with it. So what, 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 we, have to, what, what we have to understand is that the real enemy of what we're talking about is when we come with pre-constructed ideas of how the city should look physically. I think that's not I'm not saying it isn't on the agenda, it's not that high up. The one part of it which I do feel is on the agenda is this thing of elitist. I am very disturbed about the fact that the rich, and I'm talking about the rich in India, and I'm talking about the rich in Bombay, are the biggest culprits of all because we are all living in one city, and yet the lifestyle and the kind of architecture produced for the richest is so different from the kind of housing produced from the poor, as, as typologies. In other words, if I look at an old city like Jaipur, there's a unity of typology. If I look at London, there's a unity of typology. Rich and poor had bigger and smaller houses, but in one continuum. And one of the issues, and I don't want to get this discussion into physical planning because I think Peter Overlander said, please don't do that at the beginning. But the no, fact no, is no that- No bricks and mortar here. What? No bricks and mortar in this discussion. That's right. But the question of human equity is a tremendous one, especially in our cities. Right. And yes, so I wish we would discuss that a little bit. I'd like to pursue that. Uh, 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 Dr. Sarah Galdin, I think you wanted to come in. Uh, thank you. I, I really wanted to say two things about cities, the positive side of cities that you raised, uh, Mr. McNeil. First is, without question, they are the engines of transformation and modernization. And there's no record in history of modernization without urbanization. So that is, really has to be conceded up front. Secondly, they are indeed very efficient. The question is how to make them more efficient while making them more livable. I think there is a misconception that somehow economic growth requires pollution, uh, requires uh, inefficient use of energy, and that is just not true. In fact, all the evidence we have is that it is far better to learn from these lessons and avoid the pollution and avoid the inequities 
and maintain the efficiency, and if anything, the efficiencies will increase. So that I do not see a dichotomy between the growth of cities and at the same time the improvement of the well-being of people. But it will require bringing out the humanity and the solidarity in the cities. And in fact, the point that Charles Correa was talking about, avoiding this growing inequity where cheek by jowl, very rich people and very poor people, in fact, are coexisting. Well, are we in danger, though, in sending such a message of alarm to the world about the growth of cities that the positive, um, um, their positive aspects are obscured and there is this huge ideological bias being created uh, in favor of the negative aspects, if you see what I mean? But I was trying to say that I believe that they are uh, very strongly in the positive value of cities. I'm just recognizing that one of the problems that we have to deal with is the inequity issue. That uh, if you have this condition of extreme misery for a very large number of people, and we have to recognize, I think it was mentioned earlier on by the mayor of Accra, that the vast bulk of the, the, this whole population is extremely young. These are new entrants into the labor force. These are people who over the next generation are going to be forming households, coming in seeking jobs, as uh, Atal Chessinger said and that the framework must be an enabling one to allow them to come in. But I think we should stop bemoaning the growth of cities. It is going to happen, and it's a good thing that it happens because cities are the vectors of social change and transformation. Let's just make sure that the social change and transformation are going in the right direction. Yeah. Mrs. Turden. I think this uh, discussion uh, about uh, how city uh, uh, will be constructed is quite interesting because we need uh, really pu uh, take in uh, the physical planning in it. Because if we look up on the human settlements, there you, you have a sort of meeting place uh, from all that bothers us. Uh, uh, everything connected to consumption, everything connected to energy, water, uh, to uh, uh, materials connected to houses, health, unhealth, uh, society meeting places and everything is there I within the human settlements. And where do you decide about those human settlements? You decide within the physical planning. There you make your, the priorities. You make the priorities if there will be healthy or unhealthy human settlements. You make the, the priority if there will be someone else who has the access to capital, to owning, and so. The, you make the priorities to householding and expanding. A lot of very valuable priorities you make there. And when you mention planning nowadays in the world, uh, many people, oh no, not planning but you have to plan for freedom. You have to use the word freedom together with the physical planning because if you don't have the vision uh, when you are making the decision making, you will never reach what you want. Uh, Dean Morton, do you want to come in? We talked this morning about the power of images and the power of, of meaning and we were just talking about um, the, again, the, the sort of the images of rich and poor in the cities. And one of the problems, and here I think we do get into the brick and mortar city, but it's the question of really of symbol. It's the question of what are the images that everybody can see, not just the rich or the poor, but everybody can see. And if we're talking about images of real value, are those images of value just the corporate towers and the very elaborate hotels uh, or uh, apartments for the rich? Or are those images, those, I used the word earlier, of acropolises, those places where everybody can be, where the meaning is carried from generation to generation and, and the, the symbols of belonging to the corporate place? Um, I mean, corporate in the sense of, of the everybody place, uh, the agora, uh, the, the market, the stadium, the, the temple, the opera house, those symbols that are really for everybody and not just for the rich. It seems to me that we have to, when we're t talking about priorities, uh, really raise the question of how much is going to go for those things that are indeed public, but public with this lower, deeper, symbolic, historical, spiritual meaning. Dr. Lambert? Uh, first of all, I think that 
You can have a huge city if you organize it in a way that makes it work. If you have neighborhoods that are linked by public transportation. Now the neighborhoods can be very different. Uh, obviously they are different if they're built at different times or different uh, you know, way, ways of building them. So that's, but they have to be linked by tra public transport. And I think that for the big new growing cities uh, in the world, if, you know, there's a question that they like to build schools and things like that. Well, you can, go, you can make a school almost anywhere, but if you don't make that public transport system now, as the cities get bigger, then you really are in a horrendous uh, mess because you get the cities choked with traffic and the things we know. And I'd also, I'd also like to address the separation of rich and poor. I don't think the rich and poor cheek by jowl is a problem. I think the, pr the problem is the separation of the rich and the poor, sending the poor out to the suburbs, sending the old people out to some other uh, place. I think that uh, one has to be able to have that diversity in the city, and uh, it has to be pla the new sections have to be planned that way, and the old sections kept intact as they did in Rome, as has been done in Paris, with the, you know, and, and, and those, are, those are ways of managing. Let me, thank you. Let me um, focus this a little bit. It seemed to me that, the, and we've heard it again from every speaker this afternoon, that the commonest theme we've um, um, heard so far today, um, common to just about every speaker here, is that human solidarity demands some recognition of the existing and growing gap between rich and poor and seems to demand some effort to narrow that gap. I think it was first raised by Dr. Hassan. Would you like to elaborate on that? Do you think that the message that should go out from this forum is that human solidarity requires some massive effort to narrow the gap within countries and among countries. Oh yes, for sure. Now how this do you is, do that? Yes, yes, <laughs> definitely so. And I would really would like to add also that uh, uh, let us try to discuss together what really caused what I would say the regression of solidarity that it's always there in primitive societies why it is in primitive and even up till now in small rural villages, it's there, but it's not in the city. The, the divergence of lifestyle, the difference and disparities really create something that weakens this solidarity. And I think this, if we would hear from the audience also about how can we uh, narrow that or uh, remedy that, in order to bring it up, because it's something that spontaneously is generated, you know, it is not to be implemented by people talking to people or something like this. It is, it, it's a phenomenon that is adiabatically is generated. And a phenomenon that's getting worse in your view. Yes, you know, yes. Uh, incidentally, you referred to the audience. There will be an opportunity for members of the audience to ask questions and make observations in the last hour of our uh, discussion today, and I will invite invite you to do so then. You made, you emphasized this very strongly, Dr. Uh, Sarah Galdin, in your, um, in your remarks. What does, what do international institutions, nations, north, south, within countries do about this? You, you mentioned the uh, extraordinarily, um, the reluctance of the 20% who own 86%, I think, of the world's wealth. 83. Uh, 83% <laughs> of the world's wealth begrudgingly offering or refusing to offer 0.3% of GNP, GDP in helping uh, less fortunate countries. So what do you do about that? Well, I think, Ms. McNeil, that there are two or three things that we need to do. Yes, we need to get the people in the North to feel greater solidarity with the rest of humanity. Uh, they are, after all, those who have the biggest impact on both global markets and the utilization of the world's resources. Uh, but above and beyond that, we also must recognize that there are rich people in poor countries just as there are poor people in rich countries. And that the equity problem therefore has to be addressed not just globally but also internally within societies. Now the point I was also making in my brief introductory remarks is that we know the answers. In this conference we have an occasion to discuss best practices, to review them, and what is needed is that the best practices of the few become the standard practices of all. We know, for example, that the absence of water and sanitation in the cities can be met and, in fact, met also for the growing next population at about $100 per person, and that represents 0.2 to 0.5 percent of the GNP of the developing countries, of the developing countries over 15 years. 
fully doable. What is required is to change the procedures by which people are dealing. It is not a top-down Department of Public Works approach. It is an empowerment to the local so community to enable I, them to do this and to give I them the funds to do this. Respect, I ask you not to come up on the Dr. platform and take pictures. Please, would you take the pictures from that? Dr. Ferdin has, has uh, mentioned, I think, the, the, uh, the fact about uh, access, access being an essential part. Access to microcredit, we have seen, has been able to allow the poorest of the poor to pull themselves up by the bootstraps in a dramatic way. Uh, SEWA is recognized, uh, the, the Women's Bank here, as one of the best practices. There are others like it, from Grameen to Brac to BRI in Indonesia, Axion in Latin America, the CARAP in, in, in Kenya. So many examples which shows that you can, in fact, by providing the poor access, not subsidies, but access, they will be able to pull themselves up by the bootstraps. We know that we can do a lot more on these issues. And that is why we need to change the attitudes of people that simply seem to see this as not doable. And uh, I end with a small quote uh, of, uh, of uh, a lady I admire, Barbara Ward, who said, uh, in fact, you know, never underestimate the capacity of a few dedicated people with a shared vision to change the world. In fact, looking back at history, nothing else has ever changed the world. If it is so well known and so obvious, why, why is the situation getting worse? Um, let me ask Mr. Tandon for an observation on that. Well, <clears throat> I think the the knowledge about what makes uh, neighborhoods uh, more humane has existed through history, through the living experience of people. Why it is getting um, worse or why it is not improving has to do with ways in which the distribution of knowledge itself has become very iniquitous. You know, uh, we were discussing earlier in the pre-lunch session, several speakers commented about the question of access, the question of using people's own wisdom and knowledge and experience, and uh, the kind of formal expertise that has come to dominate much of our urban planning or development design has alienated the traditional wisdom that many communities and citizens had. So it's, it's not that uh, ideas about solutions did not exist. It is to transform those ideas in a more complex, and much more uh, interconnected world that requires a uh, new effort. Uh, Mr. Kolick, you mentioned um, that um, people in cities uh, want equality, and they want their government to help promote equality. But even, for instance, in Israel, which was a world example of a state which promoted social equality, uh, that... Yeah. Yes, the, I was going to say the gap between rich, the gap between rich and poor in Israel. I, I once, Has grown. I once uh, talked to Golda Meir before she died, and she deplored the fact that in the next generation, much of the idealism of the first generation was being lost as it became more materialist. And so, even in a state dedicated more than most to some equality, uh, as you say, things go backwards. Why is that? I think we saw other tasks as. Uh, being more important. One was absorption of immigrants. Uh, we have uh, absorbed many, many more immigrants uh, than we had population. Uh, if you would compare this to absorption of immigrants which makes uh, problems in the United States or in Germany or wherever in France, uh, we have absorbed many, many more. And on this, uh, the uh, volunteerism hasn't shrunk. We have uh, another one, a serious problem of security. People are still called up to the army for two years and they say we are doing everything we have to do by being for two years and this is not justified, but it's a good excuse. And uh, I think our major task in the near future will be to go back again to the original ideas of greater equality there is a good deal of uh, volunteerism in work, um, in work with children, in work with sick, in work with various other things. Uh, particularly, I think, uh, to a great extent, because there's a feeling of obligation, the Arabs benefit from this more than the Israelis who feel, uh, people feel that uh, they can take care of themselves. 
So, the, but the picture is dark. It isn't as good as it used to be, and we have to do a great deal about it. Uh, when I still had hoped uh, that uh, the selection would turn out differently, I wrote an article that after the elections, this is what I want to devote myself to, to uh, resurrect uh, social responsibility and uh, the same good habits that we had before. Uh, Mr. Um, um, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Fuller, uh, you referred to this uh, earlier, and yet in your country, um, the richest of the richest country in the world, there is also the growing gap between rich and poor. Um, and is this, what do you see as the obligation if we're to promote human solidarity and achieve peaceful and humane cities to do something about this, and what? Unfortunately, in our country, and I think we probably are the leader in this, uh, we glorify and promote greed. Uh, we have a very successful TV series, The Lives of the Rich and Famous. Uh, we glorify riches, we glorify people who uh, consume enormous uh, uh, resources, and uh, and and we 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 have it all. There was a man in Atlanta, Georgia, recently who built a twenty million dollar house for himself, uh, for his wife and himself, and I think two children. And he was interviewed by the the, the newspaper, and a, he was asked the question, "Why did you build a twenty million dollar house?" And he said, "Because I'm a born again Christian. I did it to glorify God." Um, so. We, we have a distorted view of what is ethical conduct. We have a distorted view of what is right thinking. And, and one of the consequences of that is, I think so many people in our country, and this is not limited to the United States, but it's very true in the United States, that people want to make the most money that they can. That is the leading criteria for the work they do and where they live is how I can make the most money uh, in my life. And the consequence of that is that for most people who are talented and educated, you can make more money in a city than you can out in the countryside. And so the talent migrates to the city and it depopulates the countryside as far